Thank you. Well, first of all, I have to say that even though I'm with government, I'm not in my government official role. In fact, I'm on vacation. So I don't represent anything that government really think about that. Um, and um, I guess the big question uh, in the, my presentation is um, how risk and resilience are connected. And I will try to go through the whole process of that. And I'm not going to give just the five minutes of my time. Uh, so while this is like clear cartoon, uh, we are different. Uh, risk people and resilience people may be different. We, in fact, here, a very different, different view on resilience and risk. So uh, this is from one of my uh, papers uh, where we try to bring back elephant that Roger already mentioned. Uh, if we all sitting in our silos, we really not talking to each other. In most of the meeting, we try to inform each other about what's going on. Uh, but it's not enough. We really need to kind of get outside of our usual boxes. And in my presentation, I will try to start doing that. I may be critical about like approaches that some of you are developing, but it's only with the intent to push outside and stimulate creative thinking. So I hope nobody will take it personally, but feel free to defend and be more aggressive. I think that's why we are here. So what I will try to do, I will try to really start with differences between risk and resilience. And for me, uh, the difference are uh, non-threat uh, versus a non-threat, uh, necessity to have a critical function that requires stakeholders' engagement, uh, system versus components, and temporality. So those are main areas that I will try to convince you that this, in fact, that's true. Then I will try to go to signs of resilience. Um, so we have many qualitative type of processes, tools. I will mention some of them. And I really hope that this meeting will move towards quantitative. This is like, if anything, uh, I like to do is to really figure out how to do that. Because for my agency, Army Corps, it's really important to quantify resilience and integrate it with our um, ability to select right projects, do right things, and uh, be within money that we have available. Uh, so I will, before I get to what we are doing in Army Corps, I will mention uh, ways to integrate risk and resilience. So, uh, well, unknowns. Um, I guess I'm lucky to be able to teach in Venice uh, each October for the last three years, and I get to know Plague, and some of you heard the story, but you know, many of you didn't. But Plague was emerging uh, threat, of course, and uh, within time frame of a couple of decades, uh, to sort of population of Europe were dead. And I was kind of thinking, if I am in, um, in Venice uh, 700 years ago, how would they do risk assessment? Uh, Roger started uh, thinking about that. And um, uh, the, the framework that was developed uh, back in like 70s, uh, early 80s, was this triplet. What can happen? How likely is it? And what are the consequences? So uh, to be able to do risk assessment, you really need to quantify all of that. Um, and let's imagine we are in Venice uh, a long time ago. So what did we know about threat? Well, almost as much as we know about cyber threat nowadays. Uh, <laughs> somebody sends them. Uh, and what we can do, we just need to pray and you know, that result in all these beautiful churches. Um, but really, back then, that was a uh, common belief. Uh, so another thread is, of course, you see black death, you have all the skin irritation. So what do you do with that? Well, we had metals. We put metals and see what happened. Of course, that was not efficient way of dealing with, um, with the, the disease. And you know, the very interesting thing was vampires. I never heard about that before. I spent time in Venice. But the common belief was that vampires really spread the disease. And of course, what do you do with vampires? Well, you need to be very creative. And that's, in fact, what we do with developing different scenarios for risk assessment now. Well, you, uh, you put a, mouth, a brick in the mouths of people who are dead, and then they cannot shoot their way out of graves, because that's what vampires do. So you kind of mitigate that. But it works. Yeah, so I will come to Venice at the end of my presentation, because what they did, uh, it was different from risk, because risk assessment was not possible. And that was resilience. Um, so let's have modern day example. I think Adam here from Jamaica Bay. And this is an example that was inspired by Jamaica Bay. So what we do in risk assessment, uh, we are Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, this is the system, but we don't care about the system. We don't care that flood, in fact, actually can flood this Jamaica Bay from the, somebody else is responsible for that. So all we do, we build this. 
because that's our risk mitigation strategy. We get money to do that. So we don't care about system, we don't care about others, we just do what we feel within our universal responsibilities. Of course, and this is risk assessment, this is how we practice it. Well, of course I'm exaggerating, but um, uh, so we need to calculate need of height of seawall, we need to have scenario of hurricanes and all that. We say, well, you know, we can deal with category three or four or five, depending how much money we have. And we just build that wall and that's it. Uh, of course, at the system level approach, you need to think about all other things. Uh, you have different ways to deal with that. And that's where resilience come into the play. In my mind, you need to be able to select all those from system point of view. So this is like a major difference. So this, the first one was a known threat. This is like system level assessment. Um, and uh, next one is for me, uh, stakeholders engagement in critical function. In risk assessment, uh, a critical function is actually our agency mission. We do flood protection, let's build levy. Um, but in reality, critical function is what this community believe is critical to them. And the way we do in risk assessment, uh, we, uh, of course, well, uh, Roger and Jose and others have different ways of dealing with that. Uh, but in reality, we initially listen to stakeholders. You know, we, like, we, we don't like to have floods. And then we build that seawall. And well, not we build, we, we plan for seawall. We go to community and say, well, we are going to build this and this is, is good for you because, well, Category five hurricanes are unlikely, so we deal for category four, and we have so much money and all that. And you know, at that point, stakeholder may say only yes or no, because if they say no, then Army Corps is not going to help. Um, so, uh, in resilience world, you start with critical function. You really go to stakeholders and ask what is important for them, and that's differentiate risk and resilience in my mind. So, uh, and of course, temporality is another thing. A risk assessment is based on past. They try to um, go from past to the future. There are no um, recovery time. Uh, and um, we'll talk about that later. In resilience, that's actually nature of resilience. So attention to resilience uh, evolved within the last two years when, at least in the US, um, Obama administration started to put resilience in multiple executive orders that force agency to look at that. Of course, some people like David were working on that for a long time. Uh, we kind of uh, started a bit earlier as well, but not as long as some of you guys. Um, but uh, this basically definition of resilience that is very common in the US, though there are some arguments still that resilience means ability to anticipate, prepare, adapt, uh, and response. So you have this kind of temporal pattern when you have critical function, uh, you plan prepare, something bad happened, you absorb, your critical function drops, then you recover, uh, you may recover to even a better level or to the same level, or you may not recover. And those are stages of the resilience cycle that you have. So uh, if this is resilience, what is risk? And uh, that was our paper in Nature Climate Change that resulted from a meeting, uh, like small meetings like that, but short one. It was one day meeting in Berlin. Uh, but we conceptualize it there this way that uh, risk is actually just one point in this curve. Risk is probability that your critical function goes down. It doesn't have temporal dimension. Uh, and resilience is uh, this area. So you can have, uh, you can go really, uh, low, but you can recover fast. When I look at sun, for example, my vision goes to zero, but it's immediately recovers. And if I'm not driving, that's fine. So this area would reflect that. Well, from any risk assessment uh, point of view, that's completely unacceptable. Nobody in the risk business will allow you to drop functionality down to zero. You always have some threshold. Um, so. And of course, if you uh, visualize risk and resilience this way, you may have situation when you have high resilience, low risk, or low risk, high resilience, uh, high risk, low resilience. So you like to be here, you don't like to be there. And you know that's kind of, um, for me, uh, visualization of temporal nature of risk and resilience. Um, I'm moving fast because I have way too many slides. Um, <laughs> but I hope we'll have time to discuss all this issue because I feel it's important. So uh, back to the question I asked Roger. So we clearly see two ways in science. One is a bottom-up approach. Uh, when you start with data collection, you use models 
to characterize the risk. And as a result of this risk, you, you know, inform decision makers about the alternatives and what they uh, can or cannot do and what is the most optimal. Um, but I really believe that resilience is actually top-down science. And because, like in risks, first step is to invent these technical scenarios about threats. Um, and you actually, you can do risk assessment without any stakeholders, right? You, know, you don't need values in risk assessment. You have to, to be practical, but you don't need to. But in resilience, you cannot do that because you have this critical function and critical to whom. Uh, and that's really start with framing the problem as a bunch of critical function uh, for specific stakeholder community. They need to tell you what is critical, uh, what are the trade-offs, to which extent they can live without energy versus spend like, you know, uh, several thousands for extra generator. And that's like a real question that community like Jamaica Bay needs to address. And from that, you really start to go through pulling uh, metrics that are important, models that are important, that can help. And that's where uh, connection to risk happens. Once you really identify that, you can really design system. So uh, this is like first part of my presentation. I hope I convince you that risk and resilience are different. And you know the key differences are temporality, stakeholders, um, or something else, I don't remember, but we'll go back to that. Um, uh, so um, let's now talk about uh, if resilience are different from risk, uh, what is the science of resilience? What do we really have? I think I'm really happy to have David uh, Woods here because he and uh, Hal Nagel uh, started working on that, conceptualizing that for like 20, I don't know how many decades ago. But uh, what they've done is this abilities of the organization that they need to maintain to be resilient. So you need to learn, respond, monitor, anticipate. And then um, uh, they develop this, uh, how do you call that, Dave, dashboard or uh, the tool that, well, if you really learn well and uh, if you're really good in all of those, your organization is good. Again, I hope we can have more time to discuss it, but this is really great process. The question is how I measure learn. Is it like how many uh, training classes people have? Is it maybe useless? Is it how they communicate with stakeholders? So this um, scales, excellent, good. It's subjective scale that doesn't really have metrics. So for example, I cannot really plug that in, in uh, to my engineers who are designing Levy or figuring out what to do. But as a process, it's a really good approach. And in fact, uh, Tom Seeger and I, when we started uh, thinking about resilience, we didn't read what David wrote. Unfortunately, that will simplify our life. But we, we said that resilience is really about actions, about the process. Uh, and it's more like verb than... We <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is part of the problem. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we put similar process that, you know, if you like to be resilient, you need to really sense, anticipate, adapt, learn. Almost the same, but I don't think we really read uh, books by uh, Dave and others. Uh, well, in parallel, we have uh, uh, Craig here. Uh, in ecological system, resilience was evolving with Bass and Hollings and others um, as, again, as a process to assess how uh, ecological system evolved. I think Stockholm Institute is more or less the same. You have the process, you have some metrics, you have your way to go there and assess, but again, there are no uh, quantification um, the way I can use it uh, with engineers. Uh, and um, well, it may be appropriate in, for example, ecological situation when you need to understand how system evolved, uh, but it's very difficult in engineering situation when you need to proactively design the system. You know, to optimize and to do these trade-offs, it's, it's not going to help. Um, then we have uh, this. Um, uh, I guess this is like Roger hinted me about this cartoon about Einstein trying to figure out what to put and C squared, you know, cubic, and then the cleaning lady was saying, well, everything is squared away and you can use it. So now we have all different frameworks when people say it's like 3R resilience, it's robustness, redundancy, resourcefulness. Here it's like 5Rs, sometimes you have 4Rs. So basically it's again the same idea that uh, you have uh, several 
properties of the system and you try to quantify it, but how you quantify robustness? What is robustness? It's like probably almost difficult uh, as resilience. So you cannot really measure resilience by robustness. You know, you cannot measure, you know, uh, you cannot measure energy through something that have to be measured. You have to go like Einstein to basic principles. So um, then, uh, so how people quantify resilience? So, um, well, of course, everybody is working on metrics. So we have USGS, Peter is here. We'll be talking about our committee that looks at metrics. We have I don't know, big Excel file with many, many pages. This is U UNISDR, uh, I think we have. They're here, they have like 56 pages of metrics. It's all great, it's all great metrics. Uh, the question is again, how I can use them? Which ones are relevant to me? And how, uh, if I go to my community and ask them um, what is relevant, how I integrate that one metric is more relevant than another? That's a very good question. Um, so when you go to metrics, uh, of course, you need to pull them together. And here we go with Susan Cutter. She was one of the first people who developed um, uh, disaster resilience index. Right? So this is one of her early papers. And you can see that uh, Florida, and we have uh, uh, people from Florida here, apparently you need to leave. Uh, uh, <laughs> If you're thinking about res disaster resilience, the, the best area to live is in the coast. So imagine a little bit of snowflake there, everybody will be killed. But what Susan Cutter is saying that actually resilience is low in the middle of Florida when you know only few people live and nothing will probably happen if you have lakes. So why? Because uh, they have like multiple metrics and she placed a lot of uh, value on metrics related to economic side. Of course, people have money here. They quickly recover. If you're talking about real estate, of course, people have money and they rebuild houses. But if you're talking about traffic accidents, a medical emergency, there's and all that, of course, that will be disaster. Um, so that's actually led us to a very interesting study. When we look at multiple uh, indices and we try to use like real disaster data to validate them and see whether all these uh, community resilience indices produce similar result. And uh, Laura Reed is here. She is co-author of that paper and did a lot of work. So if you're interested in that, we can talk to her. But this is some of the indices we look uh, or available. Uh, you have FEMA, you have Community Resilience Index. Again, I don't have time to talk about that. Nature Conservancy, all of them are a bunch of metrics that are visualized in a map. And what we've done, as I said, uh, we put all of them in the same scale and we plot different maps uh, using different indices. And then we had like real thread and see how they, like different communities will react on that. And of course you can see that, you know, different indices predict different ways. So one indice said that this community is resilient and others said it's not resilient. So um, it's a big mess. But uh, the reason for that is that all these indices use basically like, I don't know, a few real metrics, but then they combine them in a different ways. And of course they get different results. And that's weaknesses of these approaches. All these indices are, are kind of a bottom up uh, approach. They start with what you can measure and you combine it, uh, but really you need to start with not what you can measure, but what is important for your critical function. So that's part of the problem uh, with all that. But unfortunately, this is like most of the agencies are working along these lines. Let's measure something, let's pull it together, let's get a bunch of good scientists who will tell us how to pull it together, and that's it. But I hope our paper will be published soon, and hopefully it will kind of at least stimulate discussion about this. Uh, okay, so how much time I have left? On? About five minutes. Okay. Uh, so this is what we proposed. Um, so we proposed to develop metrics, but in a smarter way. We like to step top down. So we know that resilience is about prepare, absorb, recover, and adapt. And we know that we're dealing with complex systems. So you have physical domain, we have uh, information, cognitive and social. So you need to have metrics in each of the cell representing this. So Can only- Explain these four domains. I don't know. Uh, okay, so uh, imagine that you have, uh, coastal community, right? So physical domain is like sea level rise. Uh, our protection is like physical infrastructure, buildings. 
uh, information is your monitoring, um, what's happening, what is the water level, what is the weather forecast, uh, so information that describes what's going on from point of view of what you do uh, from point of view and from point of view of what's going to happen. Uh, cognitive, uh, it's more like how well you can make decisions. Um, and social, whether your community is prepared to deal with threats, uh, whether they have, like if you think about adapt, if they have a past uh, disaster, whether they have enough uh, ability to change their behavior, or in prepare do they have emergency drills and all that. We can talk more about that, but I like to go through that faster. Uh, so what we do, we have metrics in each cell, and then we uh, have, this metrics allow you to assess baseline resilience, if you integrate them with weight associated with community preferences, and then you have multiple alternatives, and you can compare and say, well, this alternative costs a lot of money, but it increases resilience a lot. This one uh, costs less, but it just increases just above community threshold. So you can select what to do, and that's what we need in Army Corps. And this is another visualization. So this project works in physical and information domain. Uh, so you build something uh, like, you know, levy with monitoring system. This one uh, you can see working with community. Uh, and uh, if you integrate them, this change uh, from baseline 43 to 51, this to 47, so this one is better. So this is in the nutshell how this would work. I hope we'll have time to discuss it in more details because I have a couple of minutes and i like to say about uh, another way that we are working in my team is to really use network science to address resilience because this physical information and social domain are network and Tom Seeger and several others working in the same way. So you define resilience as this uh, time uh, area where the system is down. And uh, this is really core. I really hope we'll discuss it more. For me, uh, resilience is about uh, properties of the network. So it's characteristics of node links and network structure. So now, uh, how we integrate risk and resilience? Well, um, this is from, from a, a report from Switzerland that is a couple of years old, but resilience can be goal of risk management, can be part of risk management, and can be alternative to risk management. I hope we'll be able to discuss that. Um, so uh, if you look at this risk cycle, risk can be prepare and absorb. Resilience is recover and adapt. That's another way to visualize it. I've seen many uh, papers when they, instead of doing resilience, they say, well, you have risk of functionality goes down, and then you have risk of being down for so, so long time. You kind of integrate this to risk. Is it resilience? I think, no, it's still risk assessment for me.